So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our, our next speaker. Uh, we just met today, but we've had a lot of correspondences. This is Miera uh, Epline, and she comes to us from Duke University. She's, uh, ex her expertise is in cancer epidemiology with a focus on uh, the role of H. pylori. Uh, and I'm particularly grateful to her, to her kids because she was supposed to be at an NIH study section uh, right now, and that goes to show me that this, this has priority. Uh, nothing against the NIH or anything like that, but I think <laughs> this is uh, an incredibly important topic and I'm and, and extremely grateful that uh, you've uh, decided to join us. And the topic that I gave her, actually originally we had her slated to uh, speak tomorrow because she does a lot of uh, epi research on H. pylori, but since today is really focused on H. pylori and the burning question is, you know, what should we be doing with H. pylori? Can we be using this to, you know, screen H. pylori and treating as a strategy to uh, prevent gastric cancer, uh, and certainly, you know, what do we do when we find it uh, to uh, decrease your risk uh, overall? So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here and see so many old friends and great people. And also, I've never gotten to talk on this subject before, so I was very excited that you assigned me this question, this controversial question, and unlike the last speaker, I will not answer it right away. <laughs> you have to wait to the end. Mm -hmm. So um, now that we're kind of switching focus to H. pylori, I wanted to go back to the really big picture of infection-associated cancers. So we're currently estimating about 15% of new cancers are caused by infection. And what are those infections? So this is the 2020 um, Infection and Cancer Lancet Global Health just came out. H. pylori's piece of the pie just got bigger even. I think it was 35% before, now it's estimated to be 36.9%. So this is worldwide, right? So that is more than the human papillomavirus for which we've developed a vaccine, more for the hepatitis viruses combined for which we have a vaccine or for which we treat. Other includes Epstein-Barr and liver flukes, et cetera. But nonetheless, H. pylori is this leading carcinogenic agent, um, and that's again based only on its association with gastric at carcinoma and gastric NHL, and we, don't, we aren't doing anything about this systematically. Just to note, I think we often, in epi, we often think infection-associated diseases are in the developing world and, you know, our hormone and Western lifestyle are in the developed bad world, but H. pylori isn't like that, right? So these are the WHO categories high income, upper middle, lower middle, and low income, and H. pylori is in green, and you see that it's causing the majority of infection-associated cancers in high and upper middle, and still actually responsible quite a few in the lower middle and low income. So this population, this group, does not need to know what H. pylori is, I don't think. Um, I will only highlight that, um, that we still think it infects about half the world's population. There is effective antibiotic therapy, although there's increasing antibiotic resistance. And it was back in 1994 that IARC declared it a class one human carcinogen. So what about gastric cancer in the US? So um, as was mentioned, I've worked a lot in Asian populations, and I'm now at Duke University, which is in Durham, North Carolina, which is a majority minority city, as we say. So the, the minority in Durham is African American. And there is a really strong disparity in stomach cancer between blacks and whites as well that we don't often talk about as much. So in general, in the US, people of color are two times more likely to be diagnosed with stomach cancer. I know these numbers have already been shown many times. I put the men and women together, but you can see about this twofold increase. Um, and I really appreciate um, mentioning Eastern Europe too. Ashkenazi Jews are also at higher risk of stomach cancer. Um, but in the, the most recent um, cancer in African Americans, actually stomach cancer is the leading cause of disparity in cancer mortality between blacks and whites more than prostate cancer and a lot of the other black-white differences we think. So rate ratios of around 2.5. Of course, people of color are also significantly more likely to harbor Helicobacter pylori. And um, there was an interesting paper just recently out in Gastro 2020 of, um, from the VA. And they looked at H. pylori positive individuals only and then who went on to develop gastric cancer. I don't know if you guys have seen this paper. It's great. I recommend it. But what's really interesting is that even among H. pylori positive individuals, African Americans and Asian Americans are two times more likely to develop stomach cancer than H. pylori positive whites, right? So there's something else going on here. Moreover, that they saw in that big VA data that if there was... Um, Notation that they had had successful eradication, so that means they had to have a positive test and then have a 
future negative test, it was reduced, associated with a significant 55% reduction of risk. And this is important because when I talk to people about H. pylori eradication to reduce risk, they say, well, not in the U.S. We haven't shown it in the U.S., right? Our clinical trials are in Asia. But, um, and again, this is not a clinical trial. This is um, a database study, but exciting to see. And back to the, the numbers. I apparently round, round up to 28, everyone else says 27.5, so I'll stick with that. But again, less than 1% of Americans will develop stomach cancer, we're still talking about thousands and thousands of Americans developing stomach cancer and dying. So um, here's my version of the Korea cascade, same one as everyone else's. But just to point out, the green here, where there's evidence from multiple studies that there are many places along this long trajectory of time from non-atrophic gastritis to dysplasia where eradication therapy could reduce risk. So I've been trying to figure out why we aren't doing anything about this. And I think one idea is that we feel like H. pylori is disappearing in the US. So hey, hands off, it's gonna go away, we're not gonna have stomach cancer anymore. And um, there's already been data out, um, actually, uh, Alison Aiello had a nice paper back in 2012 in AJE that yes, it might be disappearing for whites, but not for non-whites. So this is data I have, um, a lot of what I'm gonna show you is not published because I'm kind of excited about this topic and I pulled from different places to see what I could find in my data. So this is a consortium of cohorts that I work with. Uh, so this is the multi-ethnic cohort out of Hawaii and Southern California, the NYU Women's Health Study, the PLCO, and the Southern Community Cohort Study. And unfortunately, we couldn't do a race period cohort analysis based on our numbers, but just by year of birth, what we saw in these over 4,000 folks is that this is serology, so this is H. pylori antibodies, are going down with increasing year of birth among whites, but there's no suggestion among African Americans that H. pylori prevalence is decreasing, and moreover, that disparity is increasing. And if we look at CAGA specifically, since we know that's a virulence factor for stomach cancer, we see an even stronger disparity. So I don't think H. pylori is disappearing overall. It's definitely disappearing in whites, but not in our groups that are at the highest risk. So I wanted to also show this. So at Duke, we've been seeing more and more gastric cancer cases over the past 20 years. So the top black line is all gastric cancer cases. And one of the reasons we're seeing more is that um, the hospitals are seeing more. So this is a collaboration of three Duke hospitals. We have two in Durham and one in Raleigh, North Carolina. But what's really interesting is if you look at by race. So the red line are um, whites, the orange are African American, and the yellow is other, and I will say that the other is a lot of it as Asians. Um, we don't have that as many Asians in our um, catchment area at Duke. But you can see just in 2018, we now see more African American gastric cancer cases than we see white can gastric cancer cases per year. So the population is there and needed. So when is it time for translation? When can we answer this question? Yes, it's time for an H. pylori test and treat strategy. I think that the to me, the clinical trials are already there. They show it reduces risk, 35 to 50, maybe 55%. Um, the other really nice studies on H. pylori eradication therapy shows that it reduces risk of gastritis, of stomach ulcers, and improves quality of life. Well, that's nice. Um, we know antibiotic therapy can be curative. It can be inexpensive if generics are used. Um, and in theory, you know, two antibiotics with a PPI and or bismuth for 10 to 14 days is not outrageous if we compare this to hep C treatment, for example. Lots of arguments against, right? Majority of people will not, who have chronic H. pylori infection will not develop stomach cancer. What is it? Less than 3%, less than 1%, it's small. There is increasing H. pylori antibiotic resistance and this is a problem. And then there are um, folks that feel like there are some potential benefits of this, you know, um, bacteria that's an you know, ancient bacteria that's been with us for over 100,000 years. So how can we target those at highest risk for eradication when uh, H. pylori eradication has already shown to, been shown to be cost effective even population wide? So the American College of Gastroenterology clinical guidelines, their indications are, first of all, all patients with a positive test of an active infection should be treated, right? So again, that was a good point. That's not how things work in Korea, but here, <laughs> this is what we say. However, the question is, who do we test, right? So the ACG says we should test people with diseases associated with H. pylori, with symptoms associated with H. pylori, or with people um, taking, having exposures such as um, aspirin use, uh, chronic aspirin use that might be at increased risk. Um, but there's nothing about a risk factor, right? A non-clinical risk factor like race, ethnicity, smoking, family history. Um, David Graham down in Texas a couple years ago convened this Houston Consensus Conference, and I thought this was interesting because 
what he did is he had this one day meeting of 11 people, gastroenterologists and family and medicine practitioners, to talk about who should we be testing and treating for H. pylori. So they came up with a list of recommendations and then they sent it out to 100 US-based gastroenterologists and made them all vote. And in the end, they came with the same recommendation, if someone has H. pylori, we should treat them. And then again, you know, if they have ulcers or uninvestigated dyspepsia or malt lymphoma, but they also came up with these, these three I highlighted, which I was really excited about. These are more clinical, non-clinical risk factors. Patients with a family history of gastric cancer, patients who are first-generation immigrants from high-prevalence areas, patients of Latino and African-American racial or ethnic groups did see David and ask him why Asian American was not on there, and he's like, oh, we're in Texas. I don't know. He gave me some answer that wasn't, was not satisfactory. Yeah, we've had some interesting discussions. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I was really excited that uh, Dr. Choi was going to present, and obviously, unfortunately, he couldn't make it, um, and he already presented his work, but I just want to say that randomized control trial they did in Korea that he presented among people with a first-degree family history of gastric cancer was the first clinical trial of H. pylori eradication I've seen based solely on a non-clinical risk factor, right? And what's really exciting, again, he already gave all this data, hazards ratio of 0.45 over 9.2 years, and again, 10 of the people in the treatment group actually had, pers or five, half of the people in the treatment group had persistent infection. Moreover, the eradication rate was not great. It was only 70%. And still, using a non-clinical risk factor, they reduced gastric cancer in this population. Uh, so again, I think this is really exciting data. So in North Carolina, I established the Durham Initiative for Stomach Health, going positive, um, <laughs> because I wanted to start talking to people. Because if we want to do H. pylori eradication, test and treat among high-risk people, we have to figure out how to talk to people. And I think this is a complicated subject. So our objectives with DISH was that we wanted to do a pilot study about what is the H. pylori prevalence in this majority minority city? What are the other cancer risk factors? Um, let's talk to people. Let's talk to the community and community leaders about how do we talk to people about this and could we lay the groundwork for a future multi-site prevention and eradication initiative, which is what I want to do eventually, figure out who's at high risk and screen and treat. So um, there are a lot of things we did for DISH. And one of the things this went to those of you who are don't agree with H. pylori test and treat, and that's totally fine for asymptomatic folks. We did give them this brochure. So I went to this church, it's a mega church. I got to stand on a stage with lots of cameras, and it's all over YouTube if you want to see me and the pastor. I was the only non-African-American person there. It was very exciting, lots of music, and uh, fantastic. So I spent a lot of time with the pastor, so I did a lot of community engagement. We, we worked a lot together about what do we care about and what's important to our congregation. And one of, those, one of the great things that came to have community engagement was he said, you know, we hear about disparities all the time. We have more high blood pressure, we have more diabetes. Can you not talk to us that way? Can you say, there's something you can do about your health. There's something positive you can do. If you're concerned about stomach cancer, you can, get, you can ask your physician to get tested and treated for H. pylori. And that was great. So there, when I talk to African-American groups, they know about stomach cancer. They have friends and loved ones. It's just like in Asian American groups, uh, much more common than when you talk to your average uh, white US folks. So anyways, we made this brochure. Again, our goal was to get people to talk to their doctor about getting treated. Not to get treated, and we aren't giving out treatment, but to start that conversation if you were interested. And we gave them other information, including uh, the bottom left. What else can I do? Well, you can quit smoking. You can increase your fruit intake. You know, there are other things you can do to reduce your stomach cancer risk. You don't have to have your H. pylori eradicated. And so we did a study event at the church because we were told that's where people felt most comfortable. And um, our inclusion criteria was age 40 or over. You couldn't have been on PPIs. You couldn't have taken antibiotics in the last two weeks, right? Because the breath test wouldn't be satisfactory. Um, we did a lot of other things that I won't get into, but if you want to talk about community participation, I'm happy to at some point. Um, the church pastor, all the church elders participated, so it was really good buy-in, and we had 92 individuals participate. They took an extensive questionnaire, they took the breath test, and they donated a blood sample. So 25% were found to be H. pylori positive in this population. This was a little lower than we expected uh, based on the serology results. I will say that this church is not in downtown Durham, it's in the suburbs. Um, it's definitely a, a higher SES than the average population in Durham, um, nonetheless. Um, we returned results to individuals right away, which was really exciting because I hadn't been able to do that before. And we had a physician's executive summary so they could take to their doctor. So they said, okay, you have H. pylori. If you want to talk to your doctor about getting treated, these are the recommended treatments. Um, and then six months post-event, we went back to the church. We actually called everybody in between and we, 
it was a kind of an iterative, it's less a scientific study than a community engagement and learning process, which was great. So we went back six months later, we bought our own breath test machine, we brought our breath test machine with us to the church. So people sat there, drank the liquid, sat, and then we gave them their results on the spot. It was fantastic. So um, of the 23 H. pylori positive folks who were invited to the follow-up, 87% um, attended our follow-up, and 70% um, cleared their infection. So I was a little disappointed. I mean, again, 70% eradication rate is kind of what we hear generally, right? We heard about it in Korea, we hear it in the US. I felt like this was a really highly motivated population. I've been on that church stage a lot. I've been on YouTube with the pastor. I thought they had bought into how important this was. Um, but right, so we still had 70%, and we don't know all the reasons. Um, definitely, it seems like when we talked to people, some were prescribed the wrong therapy. What they told us, how many pills they took, and for how many days didn't really add up. Uh, definitely, there was non-adherence. And one of the reasons for non-adherence, uh, some people told us, well, I'd never heard you have to take all of your antibiotics, right? So this is a problem. But really, I think the main thing was we were not good enough about talking about side effects. And the amount of gastric distress that people experienced by taking two antibiotics at the same time, when they're not asymptomatic to begin with, right? They're healthy people and you're giving them diarrhea, they can't go to church, and they can't go to work. Um, that was something, a real learning experience for us. If we're gonna talk to people about H. pylori eradication, we have to be upfront and kind of counsel them. And then um, there was definitely some H. pylori antibiotic resistance. So um, just, on the flip side, we invited H eight H. pylori negative folks, and they all came, and they all were still H. pylori negative. I just wanted to give a couple of stories because I feel like um, when we start doing this, we start moving H. pylori test and treat into the population. It's, um, it's such a satisfying um, and fascinating experience. So for example, one participant told me she's always had stomach pain for years and years, and the year before our study, she was in the hospital for a week. And she's an older African-American woman, and I said, no one ever tested you for H. pylori? She said, oh, they sent me somewhere and they gave me this yellow liquid to drink. Nobody told me what that yellow liquid was, so I didn't take it, right? But since her pastor did it and we did it at her church, she did. So it turns out she has H. pylori positive. I saw her four days into her treatment, she already felt better. She called her gastroenterologist who said, how did, how did you do this? And she's like, oh, this lady came to my church. <laughs> and the gastroenterologist was really happy, you know? It, it, it was really exciting and she's actually now an advocate for H. pylori test and treat, so she'll be speaking with me soon. Um, somewhere else. Another participant was really interesting. Um, when she came back for her retest, uh, we found that she had persistent infection. So she took her new physician executive summary back to her doctor at, at UNC, who was a fantastic gastroenterologist, who, or, who said, you know, let's do an endoscopy and see what's going on. So I found out she had multiple ulcers, sent, took biopsies, sent them to Mayo, found out she had clothomyosin resistance, gave her the right um, therapy, and um, most recent endoscopy shows the ulcers are healing and she's cleared her H. pylori infection. So it was just a really um, exciting time to be able to really talk to people and understand what's going on. So my answer to the question is um, almost, we're almost ready to have a H. pylori test and treat, but I think we have to really develop a precision prevention strategy. And this could be some sort of algorithm that includes biomarkers such as race, ethnicity, age, sex, family history, smoking status. But I think before we actually put it into play, we have to resolve the eradication rate issue. So we have to address the issue of increasing H. pylori antibiotic resistance. And I think there are a lot of ways we can do this. There was, um, there've been some great studies that have shown if you just find out if the patient had taken clarithromycin or another macrolide in the last year or two, and you base your therapy on that, you can eradicate H. pylori at 80, 85%. Um, we need to improve patient adherence to treatment, so I do think that's about counseling folks about what to expect. Um, I think we need to think about are there other major factors for treatment efficacy and how to deal with them. We definitely need to improve physician adherence to guidelines, so I find, first of all, that physicians often aren't looking to see if they recently took antibiotics or not. Um, physicians are definitely not retesting, and if you're not gonna retest, we're never gonna know what the eradication rate is, um, and we're not gonna know if we're, we're you know, increasing our H. pylori burden by having these antibiotic resistant bugs. And then eventually, which is so great because it's already been brought up here, my goal too is the US uh, Preventive Task Force, we need to change policy. So thank you very much.